But one of the things that you argue in your book, that many of the activists that were part of the civil rights movement became professionalized. And that perhaps part of that professionalization may be, may be responsible for the failure or the development of what we have now as the new Jim Crow. Now, with that, we also now have, with having that particular strategy, we have now a new strategy that's emerging, and that's most recently developed by the Occupy movement, which has taken somewhat of a different approach of really not engaging with institutions, right? But definitely critiquing them and, and calling out for particular social change. So at this point, right now, and for many of the students, at least the students in my class, uh, the question that they've constantly have asked is, what sort of movement can we generate, what sort of strategies can we develop to bring about, or at least the end, bring about the end of, of this new Jim Crow? Yeah. Yes. Um, it's an excellent question, and <clears throat> it's a difficult one. You know, I think that there's many, many strategies. Um, one, I think it's important that we don't rule out old-fashioned activism. I think that there's a tendency in this day of kind of new social media and all that to imagine that, you know, posting things to Facebook and tweeting out a good article counts as, you know, your activism. And it certainly is an important part of sharing information and making yourself, your peers, aware um, of what's going on. But I also think that, you know, there's much to recommend in, I don't know if any of you saw Malcolm Gladwell's article, The Revolution Will Not Be Tweeted. That, you know, if you're serious about, you know, really challenging an existing social order, it's going to require you to actually get together, meet, <laughs> organize, discuss, debate, and go in, working in the very communities in which you aim to serve and to partner with, and that it cannot happen just from your laptop. And so I think that we need to both, you know, harness the power of kind of social media, but also kind of go back to some basic fundamentals um, of organizing. And it is true, you know, and I met, as you mentioned in the book, it talks about how civil rights advocates, you know, once were very much committed um, to organizing in the communities that were kind of most impacted um, by the injustice. And so everything from the freedom rides to the work that SNCC did, you know, really prioritize the you know, importance of working in those communities, organizing those communities in a, a sustained fashion. Um, but one of the successes of the movement is that, you know, many of the people who, you know, were involved in those organizing initiatives became part of, you know, the political structure itself or occupied positions and agencies or became, as civil rights lawyers, people who, you know, very much became accustomed to having battles in courtrooms or negotiating behind closed doors with state legislators, but not actually, you know, being in muni meaningful relationship with the communities they claim to represent. Um, and I think that we, if we're serious about movement building and not just kind of tinkering with the machine and engaging in piecemeal policy reform, um, we have to go back to the very communities um, that we claim to care so much about, um, engage in dialogue, listen more carefully to uh, their concerns, their needs, the way they frame their own problems and describe their experience, allow leadership to emerge from those communities. One of my own frustrations has been, I've been trying to do a lot of fundraising in the you know, recent years for um, people who are trying to engage in movement building work, and foundations are very reluctant to write checks to certain kinds of organizations, particularly if they're led by formerly incarcerated people um, or, pe or people generally. Um, but if we're gonna engage in movement building, we're going to have to build organizations that um, really are rooted in um, the communities that are most impacted. Um, it could be a variety of strategies, everything from, you know, doing the kinds of ban the box campaigns that we've seen um, in recent years that have been led by formerly incarcerated people, to strategies that have been suggested, by, like 
my people, people like Susan Burton, um, who's formerly incarcerated and has an organization called A New Way of Life, and who's right now working to organize thousands of people who um, are formerly incarcerated and are targeted um, by the police to refuse to plea out. You know, if on uh, a large scale people began to refuse to plea out when arrested, it would shut the system down. Um, about 98% of all federal cases end in pleas. Um, nearly the same percentage of state cases. There's no way the system could possibly <laughs> process um, you know, millions of people exercising their right to trial at the same time. Um, you could shut down the system overnight by people saying, I demand a trial. Now, some people would be punished severely for taking a case to trial rather than, you know, simply taking their, you know, just felony probation and going away. But, you know, I hear as I'm traveling around the country, so many creative strategies developing and bubbling up when people come together um, to think really creatively about how to challenge the system and expose the nature um, of the injustice. But I think that in many respects, you know, my book focuses primarily on the war on drugs and the impact that it's had on poor communities of color, the role it's played um, in developing this new caste-like system. But, you know, the reality is, is that so many people who were at the forefront, really the vanguard, of challenging the old system <laughs> remain, you know, locked behind bars um, because of the activism that they were engaged in. And, you know, I mean, I think Mumia, um, you know, has been the most prolific and the most visible, um, you know, of, the, of the, those who are critiquing the current system and really connecting the dots between, you know, the repression that they experienced and what is happening in the current moment. Um, but I think it's critical that they not be forgotten <laughs> as we build this movement um, to end this system of mass incarceration that was only in its infancy when so many of them were first, you know, arrested and swept in the system, that they not only be forgotten, but um, that they, you know, have a real role in this movement as well as, you know, um, the many other folks who are locked up. I think in so many ways it's fair to characterize the majority of people who are behind bars as victims of a political process and those political prisoners to an extent, but we have to recognize the singular importance of those who are incarcerated, particularly, you know, attributable to political police. You see the strategies um, that I, I, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, in Van Jones, uh, Green Color Economy, and how does that connect with, um, uh, how do you see the, uh, this fitting together? Yes. That's a great question. You know, I think it's, it shows that we can be for something, not just against something, right? So when I say we ought to be building a human rights movement and mass incarceration, I, I, I believe that we have to be for education, not incarceration, for jobs, including especially green jobs rather than jails, that there are alternatives um, to this system of punishment that we've created. Um, alternatives, you know, as Van and many others, you know, have articulated, serve to support thriving, caring communities, um, you know, for the benefit not only of the residents, but society and indeed the planet as a whole. And so I think that, you know, the green jobs movement, um, which has prioritized, um, you know, hiring, training, employing, you know, formerly incarcerated people and people in ghettoized communities who, you know, really have suffered the most as a result of deindustrialization and, and globalization. Um, I think the green jobs movement is an excellent example of the way in which a human rights framework um, will emphasize not just you know the evil that is being done by the current system, but the necessity of us turning towards you know things like the Green Jobs Initiative um, rather than jails as our primary response to people living in, in poor ghettoized communities. Quite seriously, if young people in large numbers do not find their voice in challenging the system, we don't have a lot of hope. So I think first and foremost, you have to view yourselves as critical to the movement. Um, not just asking, well, how can I be part of this movement? Where do I fit in? But how can I help to lead this movement? Um, that's what, that's the 
framing of the question, I hope that you would ask yourself and together with others, how can I help to lead and build this movement? What is the vision I have um, for the movement? You know, I mentioned SNCC earlier. SNCC was formed in large part out of frustration um, with the NAACP and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference you know, feeling, feeling as though, you know, those civil rights organizations were not moving with the sense of urgency and militancy that was required of the moment. Um, and it was young people um, who said, we are going to take matters into our own hands. And you may not be willing to continue the freedom rides, but we are going to do it. Um, and you know, young people historically have been at the forefront of movements that have been willing to question the status quo. And so in that tradition, I hope you'll approach you know, your own question with an attitude, how can I help to lead this movement? How can I and my peers um, really perform leadership roles? Now what can you do? The first thing you can do is take responsibility for waking people up. Waking up those who are within your circle of influence and concern. So, you know, you're in high school, the question is, what can I do to raise awareness in my high school to ensure that, you know, people no longer believe the myths um, that are used to rationalize and justify the system? How do I wake people up, stimulate that awakening, and then ask, you know, what is it that I can do? What kinds of tactics and strategies can be employed working individually and collectively? I'm very excited about the Students Against Mass Incarceration groups that have been popping up, you know, how can we form an organization of students that is committed to doing precisely that and connecting with other groups to begin to strategize and ask these hard questions? I can give you some examples of what some young people are thinking about doing. Some young people are thinking about organizing campaigns in the spirit of the anti-apartheid movement that called for divestment. You know, running divestment campaigns, demanding divestment, demanding that business di businesses divest from private prisons, demand that schools divest from private prisons. Many people don't realize, you know, that universities may unwittingly be investing in private prisons because their pension plans or whatever investment funds, mutual funds they're investing in include private prisons. Running divestment campaigns raises awareness. It's part of kind of that awakening process and helps wake people up. You know, the United Methodist Church recently announced that they were divesting from private prisons, making sure not one drop of any money um, was invested in any pension fund, any mutual fund that supported private prisons. So you could run divestment type campaigns. You can think about boycotting, or organizing boycotts of, you know, companies that benefit in any way from prison labor. So many corporations today are moving their jobs, not overseas, but behind bars, because you can exploit prison labor. Um, there are student groups that are thinking about holding marches, organizing sit-ins to demand attention um, raised to these issues, you know, in corporations, targeting private prisons, et cetera. There's a whole laundry list of ways in which you can get involved in terms of activism, but I think the most important thing to do is form an organization, begin to brainstorm, and commit yourself to waking up those around you and having those critical conversations about the type of activism um, that resonates most deeply with you. The amount of time it takes uh, people to get involved, I think, is a, is a barrier for those to get active. Um, so to what degree do we face, do we have strategies or ways to move forward when so much uh, people's survival is dependent on these prisons in rural communities as well as um, being a lawyer in certain circumstances and creating you know, your position and trying to maintain that while at the same time wanting to undermine the other system that makes that necessary? Yes. Well, it is a challenge. Um, you know, as far as private prisons, you know, I actually don't spend a lot of time in my book or often in my talks talking about private prisons in part because, um, you know, fewer than one in ten prisoners are currently held in private prisons. Um, you know, pr private prisons are growing and are a profitable enterprise and we shouldn't have private prisons at all. <laughs> um, but I think it's important for people to be aware that this system wasn't born of a profit motive. But once the race to incarcerate began, it quickly became clear that you could 
turn a good profit um, from caging human beings. And there's also a wide range of other corporations, and as I mentioned earlier, private interests that are now profiting from prisons. There's a very good book called Prison Profiteers, Who Makes Money Off Mass Incarceration, that I recommend, that identifies all the different kinds of corporations and you know, private interests that profit from prison. So you're absolutely right that the system is now very deeply entrenched. Um, but it's no more entrenched in our economic system and our social fabric than Jim Crow was, uh, which was a system that was deeply entrenched in the economic and social order as well. And I think rather than you know, thinking about, well, given these challenges, what really can we do? I think these challenges only underscore the critical importance of building a real movement rather than imagining that it's possible just through isolated piecemeal policy reforms that this thing could ever you know, truly be undone. Um, the challenges in terms of you know, the competing interests in terms of personal time, how do you persuade people to get involved when they have so many other demands on their time? You know, I think that for middle or upper middle class you know, folks, that really just becomes a question of commitment. <coughs> You know, how much does this matter to you? Um, for people who are genuinely struggling for survival and, you know, don't have the luxury of, you know, being able to attend, you know, meetings night after night um, and, you know, participate in the movement in the same way that people who may be more fortunate may be able to, I think it is a real concern. Um, you know, when people's basic survival needs are not being met, um, having expectations that they can then, you know, lead the movement, I think are unreasonable. And that's part of the reason why I think those who are committed to movement building must view building the Underground Railroad as part of our movement building work. Just as, you know, the Black Panther Party was, you know, running the breakfast programs and lunch programs and communities, viewing meeting basic needs of the community as, you know, central to um, their movement they're trying to build, I think we have to view meeting people's basic survival needs um, as a core part of what this movement building work is. Today, um, our government doesn't see fit to ensure that everyone is fed, clothed, receives a quality education. You know, we as a society collectively are willing to view one another as family, as people deserving of care, compassion, and concern, but we can model that, something that the Occupy movement tried to model what it looks like to actually show care, and compassion, and concern. And doing that in communities will help to make it possible for people who otherwise might not have been able to, you know, join the movement in a meaningful way, um, to be able to do so. Um, and to see that, you know, this isn't a movement that's just about talk and fighting the system. This is actually a movement that's rooted in deep care and concern um, for these communities and invite them, you know, with an open heart into participating in a meaningful way. I'm very interested into, in what you do and so, social justice as a field as a whole. And I was wondering if you could recommend certain majors um, uh, for a student, I think. <laughs> That's a great question. I am always reluctant to give advice. <laughs> I'm always reluctant to give that kind of advice because, in my view, you can make a major contribution to social justice no matter what kind of field you're in. As a musician, as an artist, as a, a business person, as an entrepreneur, as a lawyer, as a professor Archivist. even. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I really mean this in all seriousness, that um, if what you're committed to is social justice, um, I would step back and say, oh, well, what is it that I most love to do? What are my unique talents? What's my unique passions? And how can I use those skills and passions in service of social justice and the movement? Um, regardless of why or what the context was, people who do commit harm against other people are still, even beyond that, like there's just no way to even go there with some people. So I wonder how you would address that, both just in conversations, but also on a deeper level. I mean, I think it obviously fits with what you're saying about uh, a human a human right to human and it's like no matter what a person does, they're a human being and they deserve certain treatment, um, but yeah. Yes, well, 
It's, it's important because, you know, I think that there has been a temptation in advocacy, um, criminal justice reformers, to say, um, well, let's seek reform for the nonviolent offenders, but those violent offenders, well, they're kind of on their own. There's really nothing we can do to change public opinion about them. And I think that's a dangerous um, tendency. I think it makes sense for us to highlight the ways, you know, in which you know, even nonviolent offenders are being locked up and locked out for the rest of their lives. And that you imagine, you may imagine that, you know, all those who are branded felons are axe murderers, but the reality is um, that the overwhelming majority are not, do not fit that sensationalist image. So I think there's a role for that kind of education dispelling people's <laughs> stereotypes about who is behind bars and what they've done. But I don't think we can just stop there. I think that even if you're not able to persuade someone in an initial round of conversation, that over time in this movement, if we continually you know, insist on the dignity and humanity of all people, no matter who you are or what you have done, um, that we will begin to build a public consensus in support of basic human rights for all. Um, that doesn't mean that you know, it should get away with murder. <laughs> and that there isn't you know, consequences um, for the violent acts that people may <laughs> commit. But I do believe that moving towards a restorative model of justice and one that focuses on rehabilitation actually presents you know, the greatest potential for taking seriously the victim's experience as a whole. And so often when people talk about violent crime, oh, you know, the offender is so bad. I think it can be helpful to say, well, what about the victim? What about the victim? If we care really so much about the victim in this, um, shouldn't we, instead of simply investing all of our resources in punishment and locking people up and locking them out, help to ensure that when people do return to the community, that they have an opportunity um, to make a meaningful you know, reintegration into society and are less likely to pose a threat and can be welcomed back um, with genuine hope um, contributing to the society rather than being a perpetual threat. Um, I have one other point on this, which is that um, William Julius Wilson has written a book called When Work Disappears, um, which I think is a really useful text for understanding you know, how inner city communities that were once stable um, unravels, you know, with the disappearance of work. And one particular, you know, fact or statistics in the book shows that if you control for joblessness, in other words, if you compare, you know, white jobless men with black jobless men, the racial disparity in violent crime disappears. Um, that people who are chronically jobless are more likely to be violent. That doesn't excuse violence by any means. But if you want to address the problem of violence in communities, we really have to be serious about affecting, you know, to reducing the level of joblessness in communities. And simply locking people up in mass isn't going to get really at the root causes of much of the violence that exists in our communities. And whether people are going to be open-minded about that in the short term or not, um, you know, I agree, may be doubtful, but if we continue to insist on the humanity of each and every one of us and the necessity for addressing root causes as opposed to mere symptoms, um, hopefully in the longer term, we'll be able to build the kind of moral consensus that extends even to those who are classified as violent. How can we push Congress and just the government in general to at least decriminalize? And uh, my other question was, on behalf of the same board, are, um, I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous because you're so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> is the complete ab abolition of the prison system in the United States and a lot of people don't join us because they see that as too radical. So I was just wondering how do we make people change that mentality and like what do you suggest we tell them so that they can join our movement and we can start this revolution. So. Thank you for bringing out the international dimension of the war on drugs and the consensus that exists in Latin American countries that the drug war has failed and the legalization is the answer. Now, there's more than the small irony in the fact that the United States is the greatest consumer of illegal drugs and, you know, it is the demand for drugs in the United States that fuels so much.
much of the violence that you know, is occurring in Latin American countries. You know, most recently, it's been in the news, the violence in Mexico. Um, just staggering levels of violence, you know, tens of thousands of people, you know, murdered as these, you know, drug cartels fight it out. Um, you know, this violence is, you know, just like the violence associated with alcohol prohibition. You know, at the time we had alcohol pro prohibited in this country, you had, you know, extraordinary levels of violence associated with the alcohol trade. It's not surprising that it's occurring in connection with the drug trade and you know, the minute alcohol became legal, that violence vanished. <laughs> There's no longer a lot of violence associated with alcohol, uh, except people who are inebriated getting into bar brawls. So there's a reason that Latin American countries have now come to see that, you know, after decades of fighting this war on drugs and really marching to orders from Washington um, to, you know, use military style tactics and to just wage ever, you know, harsher war, um, that all you see is increased levels of violence um, as profits rise and as the stakes um, and risks go higher um, in a you know, connection with the drug trade. Um, I think that it's going to take a lot to get the American public to a place of decriminalization or either legalization, but I think it is the right thing to do, to move uh, the public conversation, the public dialogue to a place, at least initially, of looking at decriminalization. I myself am not one who have come out saying, I support legalization of all drugs across the board because I do not yet know of what the perfect model would be in the US context for regulating legal drugs, but I do think that we must, as a first step, begin a conversation about what drug legalization in the United States would look like and commit ourselves to decriminalizing all drugs to this extent. Nobody should get a felony record because they're once caught with drugs, period. And you know, there are states that have already embraced this, um, at least with respect to possession of small amounts of drugs consistent with personal use. Um, but it's the type of campaign that can become contagious. If we're able to get you know, a number of states to be able to say no one will ever be saddled with a felony record for the rest of their life because they're once caught with drugs. It's a simple message. It's easy to explain why that's necessary, why saddling people with felony records for the rest of their life are counterproductive, and it's something that can be contagious and fought for in state after state. Um, so I think we have to move in that direction. Um, and part of the consciousness raising and awakening you know, really can be around the failure of the drug war and the necessity of having a conversation about decriminalization or legalization.